In the previous video on the playlist, I derived the conservation law that says that the rate of change of concentration is equal to negative of the spatial derivative of the flux. And what we'd like to do with that is now figure out what the flux should look like for diffusion and then plug that flux in here to get what we call the diffusion equation, which is this one up here. Okay, so uh, let's just go through what diffusion is, is like. And I'm not going to give a complete derivation here. I'm just going to give some intuition for how this works. Um, but there, there is, uh, you know, a lot more detail on deriving an expression like this. So let's just write down a C of X and T that has uh, spatial variation to it. So this is low concentration and this is high concentration. So I can put little particles underneath here to represent the fact that there's not as many particles over here and many particles over here. So with that in mind, let's just see what random movement of particles would do at any value of x. So let's say we take this location x here. Let me put in an axis and an x value there. So what do we expect the flux to be j at x at time t if this is what the concentration profile looks like? So if there's a random rearranging of the particles just by thermal fluctuations, then some of these particles will move in that direction and some of these particles will move in that direction. I don't really care so much about the ones going this way but I'm interested in how many of these cross going to the left and how many here cross going to the right. And so because there's fewer on the downside of the slope, there's not as many moving in this direction as there are moving in this direction. And so around location X, the net change in particles is going to be in that direction. So that means that our flux is going to be proportional to the slope, but with a negative sign. In other words, if the slope, like in this case, is positive, then the flux has to be negative. And if the slope were positive, sorry, were negative, then the flux would be positive. So that means that I have a, an intuitive justification here for writing down the flux as... Um, negative some constant, so that's a constant of proportionality, times the derivative of concentration with respect to x. And we call this constant of proportionality the diffusion coefficient. So a larger diffusion coefficient means that you have more movement of these particles. So a larger fraction of these particles will move that way, and a larger fraction of these will move that way. But the, the overall movement the net flux is going to be down the gradient. So that's how, what, what we, how we interpret the diffusion coefficient. And now once we have that expression for diffusion, we can write down the conservation law, d dt of the concentration is equal to minus the spatial derivative of the flux. And now we can fill in that flux with minus d spatial derivative of the concentration. Now if the diffusion coefficient is constant, which is fairly typical, especially for just normal fluid with particles dissolved in it, then we end up with a d, the minus signs cancel, and I get a second derivative of concentration with respect to space. Now let's just see what this means. So how do concentrations change in time? They change at a rate that's proportional to the second derivative of c. Now, if you think about what sec what we've you know what we know about second derivatives, second derivative in this picture here, if this is c of x and t for some time t, this is how it varies in x. You can see there's going to be from this point here, there's an inflection point all the way up till this point, all the way through here. The second derivative is going to be negative. So that means everywhere between those two inflection points, dc dt, the local change at a point x, 
is going to be decreasing. And where the curvature is zero, there's going to be no change. And where the curvature is just slight, there's going to be a small change. And where the curvature is greatest, there'll be a bigger change and it gets smaller closer to where we have inflection points, where the second derivative will be zero. Similarly, between this point and this point, the, the curvature here or the second derivative will be positive, so there'll be an upward trend dc dt will be increasing in that interval. And so you can see the overall effect of those changes is to flatten out gradients. Low points get higher and high points become lower. And that's the basic principle for how the diffusion equation dictates or describes how concentrations change by random movement. So that is our diffusion equation. And now there's a, a small issue that we have to address here, and that is when I have a, a derivative in time, I need to specify an initial condition. And so I'm going to have to specify Cx and 0 at time 0 by some initial profile. And that is just the initial condition for this PDE. But I also have derivatives in space. And because I have derivative in, two derivatives in space, I'm going to need two other conditions. Now, where those conditions really matter, much like an initial condition where I want to know how to deal with things right at the beginning, right? I have a, a, a differential equation, dc dt equals stuff, that tells me how things change anywhere throughout the domain here. But right at the beginning, I... I don't have the ability to sort of think in terms of derivatives before t equals zero. And so that's why that's the location at which I need to specify um, an initial condition. Here in space, I can't, I can't define a spatial derivative. I, this second derivative with respect to x, it'll kind of break down when I get to zero and when I get to l. And so I need to specify in this case I need to specify the concentration at zero for all time and the concentration at L for all time. Or you can also specify the derivative with respect to X of the concentration at zero or the derivative with respect to X of the concentration at L. So specifying any two of these four quantities will be um, enough to... Um, pin down the arbitrary constants that kind of conceptually creep into our solution when we have two spatial derivatives. So, um, and the most common pairing is to choose two at opposite ends. So to choose either these two, that would be, so if you choose to specify these two, that would be called Dirichlet boundary conditions. If you chose to specify these two, those are called Neumann. And if you specified either these two or these two, those would be called mixed boundary conditions. And you, you in principle, you could specify these two, but that is leaving information unspecified. So we tend not to do those. Those don't lead to um, problems that are easily solved. And so, um, so now I'm just going to say a few words about um, what each of these cases means. So, for example, with if we were to specify Dirichlet conditions, we might say that C of 0 and T is equal to 0, and C of L and T is equal to 0. In other words, we force the concentration to be 0 at either end of the tube. Now, how, how could we do that in a physical situation? Um, we could have a little laser beam system set up at the edge and if a particle ever comes through this plane here at the end it just gets zapped and destroyed by the laser and that ensures that c of zero is equal to zero and the same thing at the other end um, but another maybe more realistic way of modeling how to get a Dirichlet condition of zero is to imagine that, for example, if this is, let's say, an axon of a, of a neuron and the cell body of the neuron extends out here, when the particles move from being in this region here to 
you know, if they ever come out into this big, huge space, they're very rapidly swept away from the opening because there's this huge vacuum of space for that they can fall into. And so what that effectively means is that the concentration right at zero here at x equals zero will be essentially zero because they've the particles have gotten sucked into this huge vacuum of space off to the left. And so that is one way of thinking about c of zero and t being equal to zero. If this were um, a case, so I haven't mentioned it in this video or in the previous one, but the diffusion equation is also a, a perfectly valid description for the movement of or for the, the redistribution of temperature or heat in a metal rod. And, um, and so in that case, what a zero boundary condition, a Dirichlet boundary condition would correspond to is you have heat distributed across the rod. And at the end of the rod, you can stick an ice cube, a huge ice cube that is, has an uh, infinite capacity to absorb heat. So if any heat makes its way to the end here, it immediately gets absorbed by the ice cube, and that ensures that the temperature at that end will be zero. So those are two different physical interpretations of the, the Dirichlet boundary condition. And now, uh, if we were to specify instead a Neumann boundary condition, that would mean that we were saying something like this, dc dx of zero and t is equal to zero. Or you can also specify it equal to be some particular slope. And the same thing here, that would be what we call an inhomogeneous boundary condition. But I'm just going to describe it here in a simple case of homogeneous boundary conditions. And you'll, you'll notice that here I have a dc dx. I can actually multiply this by d without really changing this very much because zero times d is zero, so it doesn't even change it. If there was something here, let's say four, then multiplying by minus d, I would just have minus d times four, and that would still be some constant. This is the flux at zero at time t. And so we're specifying that there is no flux at the zero boundary, x equals zero boundary. And so a Dirichlet condition is sometimes referred to as a no flux condition. And what that means is that there's nothing coming in or out. So if you had a no flux condition at both ends, that means that particles are forced to just move around inside the tube. The tube is sealed at either end and they just redistribute. They never escape and nothing new comes in. Now, if you were to specify a non-homogeneous boundary condition, So let's say you specify that the flux is equal to four. That means you're pumping in four molecules per unit time. So four molecules per second uh, into the tube. And so you can imagine that there'll be some constraints on what you could define at the other end if, you're, if you have a hope for things not to um, change eternally, right? So if I were to have uh, flux on the other end of, let's say, oh, for example, if I had minus four flux, that would mean that I'm pumping stuff in from the other end as well. And so I would have a huge accumulation of stuff and it would forever accumulate. So this is sort of a, a physically, uh, uh, well, it's not impossible, but it's just a scenario that will not converge to anything nice. There'll be no steady state behavior if what you're pumping in on either side uh, leads to an accumulation. And the same thing if I had a minus on one of them and a plus on the other in the opposite orientation. So a minus here and a plus here, that would mean you're actually taking particles out at both ends. And that also would, I mean, you can do that as long as there's still particles in there. But once they all run out, you'd be going negative and there's a, a you, you would have no physical interpretation anymore of what that means. So there are tricky things about specifying the flux. You have to be careful how you specify it if you want your long-term to behavior to be either sensical or uh, to avoid infinite concentrations in the long term. Okay, so that is the basics of the diffusion equation with um, various boundary conditions.